Paradigms control the results in your life. You know they have the power over everything, our relationships, our income, and when you shift your paradigm, your whole life improves. Hello, I'm Bob Proctor, and I want to welcome you to Paradigm Shift, where we're going to teach you how to make dramatic improvements in your life. This particular session is one that I really love and one you're going to love because it's going to solve an enormous problem for you. We're not only going to show you how to shift paradigms, we're going to show you how to shift a paradigm that's going to open up a world to you that most people never get to. We're going to talk about setting goals. Now you're thinking, well, everybody sets goals. Well, first of all, everyone does not set goals, and 90-some percent of the people that do set goals are setting them the wrong way. They're really not going after the right thing. They're not stimulated. That's why so many people start goals and then quit. Well, you're going to find out why they do. You're going to love this lesson. You see, goal setting, if it's done properly, you're always going to get what you want. Always. There are no exceptions to this. We want to set a goal that's worthy of us. I want you to think of this for a moment. You're trading your life for a goal. Now, I don't think you'd trade your life for a car. I don't care what the automobile is. It could be a Ferrari, a Lamborghini. Would you trade your life for it? I don't think so. Would you trade your life for a house? I haven't come across the house that I'd trade my life for. Now, I've been in some beautiful neighborhoods, and I, I have been in some magnificent homes, but I wouldn't trade my life for any of them. And yet, do you know, you are trading your life for what you're doing today. Now, if you're not going after a goal that's worthy of you, then what are you trading your life for? Do you see how important this is? Earl Nightingale said that success was the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Now, I got a hold of that definition in 1961. I have never changed a word in it. Earl Nightingale passed away in 1989. He came across it in 1951, and he never changed a word. It is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Now, stop and think of what that means. Progressive is not go and back, up and down. Progressive is continually moving in an upward direction. So if we're going after the goal we want, we're not going backwards. We're not having bad days. We are progressively going in the right direction of a worthy ideal. Now, we're not asking, are we worthy of the goal? Is the goal worthy of us? So do you see, when you look at this, it's pretty important. And then let's take the last word, an ideal. James Allen, a marvelous Victorian author, wrote the little book, As a Man Thinketh. In fact, you should go to asamanthinketh.net. Vic Johnson has really done something for that book. And you know, that book has changed more lives. Well, James Allen, in the little book, As a Man Thinketh, he said an ideal is an idea that we have fallen in love with. Every time I say that, I think of the psychologist uh, uh, Adler. He, he said, I am grateful to the idea that has used me. Isn't that beautiful? So let's think of what success is. It is the progressive realization. It's the materialization of a worthy ideal. So we're going after something that we absolutely love. Now, what is love? Love is resonance. When two people are in love, they have a rapport intellectually, emotionally, and physically. They're on the same frequency. Well, when you fall in love with an idea, you're intellectually stimulated by the idea, you're emotionally stimulated by the idea, and you're physically going after it. You're making it happen. So we want to go after a goal that's worthy of us, that we're really going to make happen, and we're going to make it happen now. Now, think of this. Let's get ready for it. We have infinite potential. Now, I've talked about this in another series here, and I want to hit on it again. No one can guess. The most erudite scientist alive cannot even guess at what you're capable of doing. You may be sitting there and will say, how do you know that? You don't even know me. 
because we all have infinite potential. You see, we're spiritual beings. Spirit's omnipresent. Spirit's 100% evenly present in all places at the same time. I'm going to tell you, when God created us, he created the greatest and the best, the highest form of intelligence on the planet. And we're not utilizing it properly. We have infinite potential. There's no end to what we can bring to the surface. No one even knows what we're capable of doing, least of all you. So why do we set goals? We set goals to find out what we're capable of and to develop the best in us. So now I'm going to ask you to stop and take a look at what you do. Now we're talking here about paradigms. If you've seen any of the other uh, shows in this series, we know that paradigms can control what we do. I say can, they generally do. Paradigms generally do control what we do. Now we want to change that. Because I want to be in control of what I do. I don't want the paradigm to be in control of me. Now, if we stop and think, we've got a ton of knowledge locked up in our consciousness, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're acting on it. Do you know, I have come to the conclusion that almost everybody I've ever come in contact with knows how to do at least two, three, maybe ten times what they're presently doing. Yet it's not that they don't know how, it's that they don't do it. Why? Because we're not thinking. Remember Earl Nightingale said, if most people said what they were thinking, they would be speechless. Listen to the conversations. Watch the behavior. Yet it's going to be obvious people are not thinking. Well, let you and I start thinking. Let's really think, why am I doing this? Why am I spending my days the way I'm spending them? How can I change them? How can I begin doing exactly what I want to do with the one life I've got? Goals. That's the answer. See, we've got to pick something we want. Now, paradigms are the roadblocks that stand between you and your goals. That's the only roadblock. I love the way U.S. Anderson put it. He said, when we fully realize that thought causes all, we will know there's never any limits that we ourselves do not impose. Pogo said the same thing. Pogo said, we have seen the enemy and they are us. Now, paradigms are the only things that stand in between you and your goals. Now, stop and think of what your goal is. You may want to be a scratch golfer. Do you know you could be a scratch golfer? A lot of people think, well, I'm too old for that. Age has got nothing to do with it. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. In fact, I'm going to digress for a second because this is an interesting point that that I've I've always been sort of fascinated with. We know, worldwide, when I say we, I'm talking about Asia, America, Europe, Australia. We almost accept 65 as being an age we should retire at. Do you know where that age came from? Most people don't. Back around 1880, Otto von Bismarck wanted to be elected Chancellor of Germany. And like all aspiring politicians, he dangled the carrot and he said, if you put me in as Chancellor, when you reach a certain age, the government will send you a check. You don't have to go to work, we'll send you a check. And he just arbitrarily picked 65 out of the ether. Well, think about it. 40, 50 years later, when they're setting up Social Security in America, somebody said, well, are they doing it anywhere else? Well, yeah, they're doing it in Germany. What age? 65. And so it was just accepted. Isn't that bizarre? Some aspiring person in Germany set an idea that the whole world has become subservient to. Why would a person retire when they're 65? Why would they ever retire, as a matter of fact? Retire means pull back from life. Well, when you're setting goals, don't let your age have anything to do with it, you know. And, and I'll frequently uh, ask someone in their 60s or 70s, you know, that said, well, I'm getting too old. I said, what would you do if you were 20? I said, then that's what you want to do. Age has got nothing, absolutely nothing to do with it. Gender's got absolutely nothing to do with it. And you want to know something else? What you've done in the past has nothing to do with it. We're talking now about you setting a goal for what you want. That's where we're going, and we're going to get the paradigms out of the way. So how do we start? Well, there's a beautiful concept. I call it ABC. Pretty basic, nothing complicated about it. And this is where most people set their goals. Most people set goals on the A level. Why do they do that? They don't want to fail. This is so silly because we're going to fail. Failing is a part of winning, but most people don't know that. Why do we want to fail? Well, let's go back to the time we're little kids. We're just starting to walk. You watch adults with with babies. We do it ourselves. And the baby goes to leave a chair, and we say, be careful, you might fall. Where did they get the might stuff from? 
the kid's going to fall. They're going to whack their head. They're probably going to bleed. They're going to cry. We're going to hurt. They're going to hurt. But they're going to get up again and keep on going. Do you see, if you're setting goals so you don't fail, you're not going to go anywhere. Your trip is going to be sideways. There's going to be no progressive growth. It's going to be sideways movement. You're not going to go anywhere. But that's what most people do. They set goals to do something they already know how to do. It's not a good idea. It's a little dumb, but we support it. We tell people they don't want to be, you know, they don't want to be unrealistic. You've got to be realistic when you set your goals. You can't have all A's. Yeah, you can have all A's. You can have anything you want. Or God's highest form of creation. I love the way Oprah Winfrey put it. She said, you can have whatever you have the courage to ask for. Yet she's right. And God only knows. She sure demonstrated it. I like the way Jack Canfield from Chicken Soup for the Soul, he said, our problem is we don't ask for enough. We're playing it safe. We're, we're playing a game that you can't win. We're doing what everybody else on the block is doing. Well, how do we get away from that? Well, we go to take a look at B-goals. What are B-goals? B-goals are where you set a goal to do what you think you can do. And we've got to have a plan. Now, we know we've got to have a plan. I mean, we've got all kinds of software today where we can lay out a business plan. This is very, we've got to know everything you're going to do between here and the goal. If you knew everything between here and the goal, again, you're going sideways. There's no growth involved. Why would we do that? It's part of the paradigm. We're conditioned to do that. You see? What do you think you can do? We've got to have a plan. Now, what's the next level? The next level is you go after the C level we're going after what we want. So you're going after what you know you can do, what you think you can do, or what you want to do. And that's where the problem really starts. Because you see, if we're going after what we want, we've got to fantasize. And you were taught very early in school, don't fantasize. That's true. Now, you got to admit, that's pretty bad advice. How did we get that advice? You see, when we're little tiny gaffers, we can fantasize. We were encouraged to fantasize. Put a little kid down in front of the kitchen cupboards and they'll haul the pots and pans out and God only knows what they turn them into, but they're making flying saucers and everybody leaves them alone because they're not hurting anybody and they're out from under your feet. They're fantasizing. But then they go to school. And what happens when they go to school? The teacher comes along and wham, they scare the daylights out of the kid. The kid's mind is taken off. They're taking a trip. They may be looking out the window and that's called not paying attention. And the kid gets punished for it. They may get sent home from school, and then the parent punishes them again. Not paying attention. You've got to pay attention to the teacher. Don't exercise your imagination. It was okay up until you went to school. Now we've got to stop. Why do you think we have great big corporations and little we creative departments? We've got to a point where we just accept the idea that not everybody's creative. Well, that is a bizarre idea. The creator is within. Everyone is creative. And there's no one that's more creative than others. There's just some that exercise their creativity more than others. But see, we put a block on fantasizing. We stop it. And so what do we do? Well, we go from what we know we can do to what we think we can do. And then we go back to what we know we can do. Why? Because you can't go after what you want. You don't know how to get it. See, we have to know how to get it. And yet, anyone that's ever done anything never knew how until after it was accomplished. Why do we do that? We do it because we're programmed to do it. What did I say? Paradigms are the only things that stand between you and your goal. They're the only roadblocks. Now, here's another thing. I want you to think about this. On the A level, we're doing what all of our friends do. Do you know that you're attracted to people that are very much like you? As a matter of fact, that's why they're your friends, because we're attracted to them. Energy attracts like energy. So we're mixing around with our friends. Now, if I went to your friends and asked them, do you want Harry or Betty to win? They'd all say yes. If we gave them a polygraph, sucked the truth out of them, it would come out, yeah, they want you to win. But they don't want you to leave. See, people don't resist change. People resist being changed. And when you leave, they've got to adapt to your absence, and they don't want you to leave. Therefore, they're not going to support you. So the group that we're hanging around with, when we go to leave and go after what we want, they're not going to support us because, you know, they've got to adapt to our absence. So what's the answer? Well, 
We take the next step. We go after what we think. Now, if you're going after what you think you can do, understand this. There's no inspiration in it. There is no inspiration in going after what you think you can do. So most people go from what they know they can do to what they think they can do. There's no inspiration there. There's no support. So they quit and they give it up and go back and they do what they know they can do. And they spend their whole life going back and forth between what they know and what they think they can do. If you're in a corporation and you're setting goals, it all has to be planned out. You've got to have a plan. You've got to give a logical explanation of how you're going to do it. Now, that is really dumb. There is nothing to be gained by living like that. If you want to win, there is a concept that must be followed. It's fantasy, theory, fact. Now, there are the three stages of creation insofar as you're concerned. In fantasy, everything starts with the fantasy. I don't care what it is. Walt Disney fantasized. Take the largest buildings in the world. It was a fantasy, you know? Onassis, fantasized, built the super tankers. How about the airplanes? It wasn't long ago, we were told we couldn't fly. Now we're flying in planes. They've got bars. And I flew from uh, London to L.A. on uh, Virgin Airlines. They have masseuses on there. You can get a massage. You can get manicured. You can lay down and go to sleep. You can press a button. They'll bring you ever whatever you want to eat. I was on a plane last night flying in here, and on the back of the plane, it's only about three months old, is a monitor on the back of the seat in front of me, and it's all touch sensitive. I can touch the menu. It'll come up. I can play games. I can watch movies. I can uh, go to the news. It's just touch, just touch, and it all works. And the, and the, the uh, steward was telling me all the planes are going that way. You see, that is the result of somebody fantasizing. You know where email came from? The result of somebody fantasizing. It just seems like yesterday faxes come out. Faxes are history today. And look at email. Touch one button. I send 150,000 emails out every day, every day to our clientele. Send them a good idea every day. As a matter of fact, if you want to get a good idea every day, just go to Insights, Insight of the Day, and, and I'll be happy to send you one. This is, this is a new world we're living in. We've got to fantasize. So how does it start? Well, you start by building a fantasy of what you want, but it's got to be a what you want. You don't have to know how to get it. Now, this is where goal setting comes in. Take a weekend, take a week, go away somewhere, sit under a palm tree, chew on a piece of straw, and just let your mind take off. How do you really want to live? Yet doesn't matter what it costs. Yet doesn't matter what the resources are. I think I mentioned on another part of this series where Price Pritchett from Texas, he said, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Don't you know that nothing is created or destroyed? Everything we need is already here, if not in one state or another. We've got to build the image in our mind that put us in the vibration we need to be in to attract what we want to attract. We're told to seek ye first this kingdom. Go inside, not outside. Quit trying to figure it all out. Just ask yourself, what do I really want? It's such, it's such a magnificent idea. Why weren't we conditioned with this idea? Well, it doesn't really matter. Somebody else may have been responsible for making us what we are. We're responsible for changing it. So build a fantasy. What do you really want? Right? Now, what you have to do now is turn it into a theory. We go from fantasy, theory, fact. So... How do you turn it into a theory? And what is a theory? See, the fantasy is done with the imagination. It's just out there. It's like a, a giant hologram of the life that we want. All right? A theory is an idea we're starting to give serious thought to. A theory is a thought or a collection of thoughts in the consciousness. It's an idea. It's an idea that we're starting to give a reasonable amount of thought to. We're starting to take it serious. Now, we have to pass a couple of tests before we can turn that theory into a goal. We have to ask, am I able to do this? Well, I'm going to tell you something. For 45 years, I've been studying human potential. I have found there's only two sources of reference you can go to to find out anything about yourself. One's science and the other's theology. Now, both of these areas clearly indicate that you and I have infinite potential. No one knows what we're capable of. We're sending spaceships off to foreign planets. Think of what we're doing. Think of what we've already done. Don't stand in awe, they did that. We did that. Include yourself in it. It was the consciousness that you're operating with that they used. Use that consciousness. Am I able? 
I don't care what religion you belong to. You could be Christian, Hindu, Jew. Every religion teaches that you have infinite potential. Yes, you're able. You might not know how. You might not have the resources, but you've got to admit, I'm able to do this. I am able to do this. Then you have to ask, am I willing? (laughs) And that's where we get caught up. Am I willing? Am I willing to experience the discomfort? Am I willing to hurt? Am I willing to give up what I have to give up to get it? Am I willing to spend the time? Am I willing to study? I remember one time reading in an airline magazine an interview with Walter Cronkite. This was years ago. And the, uh, the person that was doing the interviewing was talking to Cronkite about the astronauts because he knew them all, you know, interviewing them all. And, and the, uh, the, the interview said, they must have had tremendous courage to get in those capsules. And Cron- Cronkite said, on the contrary, they didn't need any courage at all to get in those ca- capsules. He said, they, they got in those thousands of times. They got into simulators thousands of times. They had been there many, many times. Everything was programmed. Everything, anything went wrong, they were programmed what to do. He said, what took the courage was the years of study, the sacrifice, the giving up what they gave up to learn what they had to learn to get in those capsules. Well, are you willing to pay the price? You may want to be a scratch golfer. I had mentioned that earlier. Are you willing to practice? See, I played golf, but I wasn't willing to practice. I'd go out, I hadn't hit a ball all winter, and I'd just stand, tee it up, and away I'd go. And I never knew where it was going to go. It was always a bit of a puzzle to me where it would end up. Pros don't do that. They don't do that in anything. If you really want to collect in this life at what you're doing, you've got to be willing to pay the price. Now, the beautiful thing about sacrifice, sacrifice isn't losing. Sacrifice is gaining. Sacrifice is giving up something of a lower nature, to receive something of a higher nature. You see, what you're doing is you're making a space for the good that you desire. So we start out with our fantasy. We say, am I able? Absolutely, I'm able. Then am I willing? Well, you see, if you're going after something you really love, yes, you'll be willing. I love what I do. I absolutely love it. And I'm going to do it until I move out of this body. I mean, it's just, I think I'm involved in the greatest work in the world, and I'm willing to do whatever I have to do to get better at it. I'm willing to do whatever I have to do to learn how to communicate it more effectively. You want to be willing to do what you have to do to become the best at what you're doing. You see, a pro is at his best regardless. It doesn't matter what's going on, they're going to perform. Now, when you say, yes, I'm able, and yes, I'm willing, at that second, Your theory turns into a goal. Now you want to take that goal and you internalize it. You let it move into your subconscious mind. You start adding emotion to it. You get emotionally involved. And the second you do that, your goal begins to move into form. Now, by law, that's called the transmutation of energy. See, an energy flowed into our consciousness. It had no form. We gave it form. We built the image. And then we internalized that image. It altered the vibration we were in, which caused us to act different. But you know what else it did? It set up an attractive force, and it brought to us stuff that we would have never brought to ourselves. We attracted everything we need. If it was money we needed, we'd attract. If it was a book we needed, if it was the assistance we needed, it would be there. The idea in our mind began to move into form. Do you know what that's called in religious terms? That's called prayer. Most think of people think prayer is getting on their knees and making a noise. That's what that is, getting on their knees and making a noise. Prayer is the movement that takes place between spirit and form with and through us. We're spiritual beings. We can tap into pure, unadulterated spirit, and we can build the idea out of pure, unadulterated spirit. And by internalizing that idea and turning it over to spirit, it gives it back to us in physical form. God operates so perfectly. And you know something? That idea will move into form. It becomes a fact. And that's how goals are achieved. We start out with a fantasy. We go to the theory. We pass the test. Yes, I'm able. And yes, I'm willing. And then we internalize the idea. And it moves into form. So what do we give up? We give up the idea of going after what we know and what we think we can do, and we go after what we want. So now, stop and ask yourself, what do you really want? 
See, the only prerequisite is, can you see it? Can you see it on the screen of your mind? If you can see it on the screen of your mind, you're quite capable of doing it. And then can you believe it? See, Napoleon Hill said there's a difference between wishing for something and being ready to receive it. He said no one's ready to receive it until they believe that they can acquire it. The state of mind must be belief and not mere hope or wish. And where does belief come from? It's in all the good books. It's throughout the Bible. It's throughout the Bhagavad Gita, the Quran, the Torah. You've got to believe. James Allen talks about it through his books. William James said, believe and your belief will create the fact. Well, my old mentor, Leland Val Van de Waal, he laid it out for me one day. He said, our belief system is based upon our evaluation of something. And frequently, if we re-evaluate the situation, our belief about that situation will change. It took me nine years to figure that out. That's how my life changed. I started to believe in me. I started to find out things about me. Do you know that your central nervous system is the most complex electrical system in the whole universe? There's nothing like it. It would make the electrical system in a supercomputer look like a toy. Do you know that the blood in your body circulates through hundreds of miles of passageway? In, in 33 seconds, it carries all the food in and all the garbage out in one sweeping change. If you just stop and think of all the muscle movements have to be made for you just to write your name, there's something so phenomenal about you. You've got to believe in yourself. You just have to. And then you do it. You see it. You believe it, and then you do it. Stop and think of a person climbing a wall of ice, a vertical wall of ice. How do they do it? How do they do it? Well, they're on the ground. They know they're on the ground. They see themselves at the top of the wall. They've got the equipment. They've got the shoes. They've got the spikes. They don't know the steps they're going to take. They can only see themselves where they want to go. They know where they're going. They know they're going to get there. They put one pick in, and then they put another pick in, and then they move one foot, and then the other foot. And then they adapt to the change in their conditions, their circumstance, and their environment. They're not on the ground anymore. They're suspended on a vertical wall of ice. And they adapt to the change, and then and only then will they see the next step. And they move this hook up, and this hook up, this foot, and this foot. And then they adapt to the change in their conditions, their circumstance, and environment. And then and only then will they see the next step. Do you know that's how you're going to get to your goal? That's how Hillary got to the top of the mountain. That's how Edison built the light bulb. That's how we've got the internet. That's how we've got the email. And that's how you're going to reach your goal. That's how you're going to scratch, do scratch golf. That's how you're going to set a goal that is worthy of you. God's gift to you is more talent and ability than you'll ever hope to use in your lifetime. And your gift to God is to develop as much of that talent and ability as you can in this lifetime. Now, that's all the time we have for today. But remember, there's no shortcuts, but you can make a quantum leap through the transference of information and the experience. And that's what this channel is all about. So that's what Paradigm Shift is all about as well. I want to thank you. This is Bob Proctor. Set your goals. And I'll see you in the next show.